I'm going to start. My name is Tanya Domi, and I am a professor teaching in the Balkan Studies program at the Hearman Institute. And I am delighted today to welcome Utrecht University professor Eva Vukasic, the author of the newly released Serbian Paramilitaries and the Breakup of Yugoslavia, the subject of her book talk today with Professor Vladimir Petrovich, who is affiliated with Boston University and who will serve as the discussant in today's program. The Harriman Institute at Columbia University is one of the world's leading academic institutions for the study of Russia, Eurasia, and East Central Europe. Our mission is to serve our community at the university and beyond by supporting research, instruction, and dialogue, sponsoring vibrant and multidisciplinary events that bring together our extraordinary resources of faculty, students, and alumni. We are committed to training the next generation of regional specialists to play leadership roles in setting the academic and scholarly agenda, making policy and challenging accepted truths about how we study our rapidly changing world. Dr. Eva Vukasic is an assistant professor in international history at Utrecht University and visiting research scholar at the Department of War Studies, King's College, London. She is a historian and a genocide scholar, and her work is on irregular armed groups, genocide, mass violence, and transitional justice, especially criminal accountability. You can read the rest of her imminent uh, bio on our webpage. I would also like to add that uh, Professor Vladimir Petrovich researches, researches mass political violence and strategies on confrontation with its legacy. He graduated from Contemporary History Faculty of Belgrade. He is also a uh, a professor on comparative history of Central and Southeastern Europe, uh, where he where he specialized in this at Central European University with his PhD, completing his postgraduate studies at NEOD Institute for War, Holocaust and Genocide Studies in Amsterdam. You can also read the rest of his bio as well. Before I turn the microphone and the floor over to Eva, I want to tell our audience that you can submit questions through the chat function, uh, or if you're watching the live stream, um, I believe our Harriman uh, staff will be able to share that with me. Um, Eva will open with, uh, with her remarks, followed by um, Lado's uh, observations and questions and comments. And then I will moderate the Q&A with the audience. So now I turn the floor over to you, Eva, and a warm welcome back to Harriman Institute. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Tanya. I hope everyone can hear me well. Um, so thank you for the kind invitation, uh, of course, to the Harriman Institute, to Tanya, you as the host, and uh, to Vladimir uh, for really graciously agreeing to discuss the book with us. Um, I would like to start off by saying that there are a few people in this world who are better positioned to comment on this book than uh, Vlada. He's done research on these issues for many years. He's worked extensively on war crimes trials and the documentation that they collected and produced. Um, he, of course, speaks the local languages and is intimately aware of the context that we're talking about. So I really welcome his comments with considerable anticipation. Also, I am really delighted to see um, my friends and my colleagues and familiar names from Twitter uh, in the audience. It is such a treat to witness interest, uh, this interest in this book, and to see all of you curious to hear about it and, and hopefully read it. So I will be um, structuring my talk basically around three kind of main points or, or issues. One, I wanna say a couple of words on the process um, of research and the sources for this book and how I came to my findings. 
Then I want to discuss just briefly some of the key findings, and, and I will do that a little bit in a sort of a bullet point um, kind of a way, and then we can pick up, of course, whatever Vlada wants to point out or uh, members of the audience um, are absolutely free to, to ask, and, and we can discuss uh, these points uh, in more depth. And I will finish with just some implications of the study and kind of further avenues uh, for research. So before we start, I want to make one point because I'm often asked why I decided to focus on Serbian paramilitaries and not, for example, I don't know, all other paramilitaries in the breakup of Yugoslavia. And by extension, I think I'm asked also then, why do I focus on crimes by these units and not some others? Um, so to answer that immediately and to kind of get it out of the way, I want to make clear, and as I do as well in the book, that paramilitary mobilization was also present on other kind of sides um, in the war. Um, and some of these units, of course, committed crimes against civilians as well. Um, the second point that I want to make is that Kurt, uh, Kate Ferguson's book from, I think, a year or two ago uh, does a bit of that comparative work as she analyzed units both in the Croatian and the Bosnian kind of side uh, of the war. I think she also deals with uh, Kosovo as well. So I felt no need to duplicate that uh, effort. Um, importantly, from, from my perspective, um, Serbian units engaged across a larger space for a longer period of time. So from Croatia, from 1991, through Bosnia and Herzegovina to Kosovo. So my book looks at basically all you know, all of this space and time, a decade. Um, and it was simply a more extensive paramilitary project in terms of territory, time, personnel, the number of units involved, the material investment, and, and the impact these units had in the disputed territory. Um, I do not suggest in the book that Serbian paramilitaries were the only perpetrators. And in the book, I also make clear that police, military, civilian authorities across the disputed areas participated in victimization in different ways. For example, the genocide or the massacres after the fall of Srebrenica were largely the army's doing, um, and it was not a process that was driven by paramilitaries. And finally, on this issue of sort of selection and, and how I um, approached my research, I would say that I also prioritize depth over breadth, um, hopefully, uh, or echoing a little bit, um, uh, Leanne Fuji's, the sadly late Leanne Fuji's work um, in her book, Showtime. Um, uh, so I want to talk about select paramilitary units on the Serbian side of things, so to say, and not all of them. I will also try to deliver my comments in a way that they are understandable to those who are maybe not ex experts in every single detail or, or all the sort of small details of the, of the different actors um, that were engaged in the war in the former Yugoslavia. And of course, I'm going to sometimes use acronyms. So ICTY for the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, where a lot of my sources come from, and the mechanism or the, um, uh, I, I, I think this, we can call it like a daughter institution to the ICTY, which took over some of its, um, some of its work after the, the ICTY closed. So in terms of process or um, research and sources, um, so what do I base my findings on? And I've had extensive discussions uh, about this early on when the research was starting. And I decided basically not to base my findings on judgments. So outcomes of trials, so a guilty verdict or an acquittal is of no consequence to my findings. Um, I analyze evidence in ICTY and mechanism trials. So I look at witness testimony, military reports, orders, all different kinds of uh, uh, documents, so intelligence reports, intercepts, uh, meeting minutes, so all these kinds of documents. And I think the documents that I use are almost exclusively um, coming from the say, same side. So they are not quote unquote enemy documents on our, our Arkans Tigers. It's what the Yugoslav People's Army or its intelligence and security organs wrote about them. It's not something that the Croatian intelligence services, for example, uh, wrote. Um, so, uh, it, you know, it, it's what former members of these units themselves spoke about. So I think that is very, very important. One case, for example, Stanisic and Simatovic, some uh, in our audience might be well aware of it. Uh, its projected ending is after two decades uh, uh, next year. So this case is to a great extent about these units, uh, who established and controlled them, why, what was their purpose. 
Um, and these two were the defendants, these two defendants were from the state security officials um, from Serbia uh, and were basically in those jobs for most of the 1990s. Uh, so whatever judges decide in this second appeal will have no influence on my findings. And we can go back to this issue of kind of law and history and how they are similar or different in the Q&A. And of course, Wada has worked on this uh, very, very interesting uh, question um, as well. So on the challenges and opportunities of ICTY archives as, so and, as, as sources, also very briefly, I would say a challenge, or I would start with the opportunities actually, is the vastness of the records. So the ICTY archives are enormous. And it's, um, it's quite difficult to um, be able to uh, digest uh, uh, such a large collection. Uh, but it's also, of course, an opportunity because we have so much to study that uh, one can argue no single researcher can ever do uh, um, that much on one issue by themselves. It's really a, a lot to digest. Um, a challenge is, of course, an, is, is the uh, lack of access to important parts of this collection, um, especially in the documents that deal with state connections to these units. Um, and the Stanisic and Simatovic case is well known uh, for the number of records that remained inaccessible um, as, as they're marked as confidential. If anyone is interested in this, I also wrote an article about these archives and how to work with them, and it's coming out soon in the Comparative Southeast European Studies, uh, and we can also talk about it in the Q&A. Second point that I want to talk about briefly are the some of the key findings. So first of all, I think it's really important to say how I defined the what I study, how I define the paramilitary as I see it, of course. These definitions can be uh, disputed um, and, and are you know, all, always subject to contestation uh, between different uh, scholars. But what I came to is that I would argue that a paramilitary unit, as, as I see them in this book, are possess five key features. One is that it's armed, that it's a unit that is armed, so a group that is armed. Secondly, that it is organized, so it has some kind of leadership and hierarchical structure. Three is that um, it is recognizable by name or insignia. It, there is a way to tell them apart from someone else. Um, fourth um, a factor uh, or feature is that they are serving a political purpose, even if this political purpose is broadly defined and not necessarily publicly proclaimed. And, and five, um, these paramilitary units to be paramilitary, as I would argue, need to not form part of regular police or military. This, of course, is, you know, we're always talking about ideal types in these kinds of efforts. And in reality, of course, many uh, fell into a gray zone at one point or the other. But concretely, really, we're talking about units that many of uh, you in the audience will know, the Red Berets, Arkans Tigers, the Scorpions, for example, and, and they, I, uh, them I labeled as professionals, uh, professional kinds of units. So this is the two different sorts that I came to. The others were the non-professionals. So the Sheshelevci, the Yellow Wasps, uh, Milan Lukic, men, so the Avengers, those, those kinds of groups, uh, for those of you, of course, that know uh, more detail about the, the conflict and the kinds of units that were involved. But basically the professionals and non-professionals, the difference is in capacity. So who can climb a rope while carrying a weapon? Who can run an obstacle course quickly? Um, and there's, I would argue, a difference between the, the units that we saw deploy. Just very briefly, kind of by, by chapter in the, in the emergence of the units. So I talk about how these units came to be. Um, I talk about the ties that the, especially the professionals had with the Ministry of Internal Affairs and the state security. Um, these men tended to be younger, more trained, more capable, as I already said, and the non-professionals tended to be often recruited through political parties, for example, Voice of Shesh's Radical Party. Um, in, in the field, we would see members who were frequently fatter, older, more local um, in how they deployed. So there were really differences that we could see. Of course, this is not perfect. We could find examples that sit somewhere on the, on the boundaries of these categories, but uh, to me, this is something that really stood out. An argument that I make is also about cooperative effort and state support. So the state set up a capacity building program, almost a nursery uh, of sorts for the paramilitary units. And this was not some bottom up spontaneous effort. You know, there was really a, a, a state uh, a run operation um, where the mobilization process 
often went through kinship ties, you know, football fan clubs, of course, many, uh, many will be aware of Arkan's role there, uh, martial arts clubs. So generally with people who are already used to using their bodies for violence. Um, I think that that was what made these kinds of kind of human resources pools, if you want to uh, call it uh, that um, suitable for this kind of operation. Um, an argument I make also on the emergence of the units is that for Milosevic and the state, they, these units are a solution to a problem. It's a very concrete uh, solution to a problem where they're ready to use force, which is more trusted than the army was at the time. They're filling up manpower holes, um, much like what I think we're seeing in the, in the Russia-Ukraine situation now. And the, the state is able to use these kind of units in outsourcing violence. It's plausible deniability, we often uh, hear this term used. So the state can benefit from the violence that they deploy without feeling or facing the consequences for it. Legal, reputational, judicial, especially after the ICTY was established. In the next chapter, I talk about functioning. And, and basically here, the story is about how there was a certain hierarchy of, un of units. They were not all the same. Um, and interactions with local authorities showed that professionals, professionals were units of a different order and they behaved in ways that made that clear. They would beat up sometimes army uh, officials. They would not um, subordinate themselves in operations to, to local uh, authorities or, or uh, military forces. Um, and, and, and this was really something that we saw that was different than, uh, than the non-professionals. Um, there were also concrete mechanisms that uh, hid ties uh, between the units and the state, um, removing patches, um, signing contracts with members, uh, for example, in, in ways that were similar to like freelancers on contracts or not on official budgets. Um, all of those were really ways in which the state kind of distanced themselves. And, and of course, and, and this is also where I talk about profit-driven criminality, um, looting, smuggling, sanctions busting, uh, and we can go back to that as well. Uh, moving to the post-war period where, of course, the utility of the unit changes or the units changes after the war in Bosnia ends. Um, here, of course, we see a transformation. Many of these men go to Serbia. There is a certain merger between what is now a one legalized uh, unit, um, the unit of special operations. There is a merger between some of the remnants of these units and kind of the organized crime world. Uh, and a lot of changes basically happen in this course war period. Um, Arkan is assassinated. Um, there is the fall of Milosevic as well, largely also due to the fact that the paramilitaries, at least the YSO, kind of agree to the change of, of government and the reformist government coming in. And there's basically a process of the hollowing out of the state, which then ends, of course, with the murder of the reformist prime minister, Jean Jic, uh, by one of the, the, the members of this world um, uh, from the Red Parades. Um, so basically, the, the reformist government after Milosevic tried to curb these activities, but struggled as the state was hollowed out in a way um, by, by, by this deep connection and criminalization that went on for a decade. And, and just to say a couple of words on paramilitary violence, which is also one um, chapter uh, in the book, ba the basic argument here is that different units attack civilians differently. Um, and this is directly tied to how these units are set up and organized. They also attacked ethnic uh, Serbs, and I talk about this in the book as well, um, and we can discuss it if you're interested. I make an argument about how these different units commit different kinds of violence. Some of them um, perpetrate instrumental violence, you know, arrests, beatings, detentions. Uh, they shoot people in the head and sort of move on, to, to kind of paraphrase one of the quotes uh, from the book, while some of the non-professionals are much more likely to engage in torture and extreme cru cruelty, um, what um, sort of I took inspiration from Fuji's work, this idea of putting on a show. So um, here I think there's really a difference. Um, and this is, I think, a contribution that I make in the sense that um, there hasn't been an, an in detail sort of study of what kind of violence these units uh, perpetrated. And here I think it's also really important to say that impunity was very much the driving force, a driving force of this continued violence. Many of the units faced absolutely no consequences for attacking non-Serbs non and in, in a way that send a message about what is allowed 
and, and, and what was not allowed. Um, in the context of this, I just want to take the opportunity to recommend Hikmet Kacic's book and, and Christian Nielsen's book. They talk about camps and then the, the police in, in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina on the uh, Republika Srpska um, uh, authorities. And, and I think they really uh, go in depth on some of these processes and in some way touch on this as well. And just two or three points to, to finish on. Um, what, is, what are the implications of, and, and what are some of the, the important future avenues for research? Um, one is that a number of units of such units, different irregular armed groups in the world is rising. So the ICRC, UN reports um, continuously suggest that. So I think it's really important that we understand uh, these different kinds of actors and their diverse and changing sort of relationships with the state and, and the different ways in which they perpetrate violence and harm civilians. Of course, in, in the news, of course, we've, we've seen um, a lot of reporting on Wagner, which is also in, 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 in a way kind of a tool of outsourcing violence to actors who are seemingly independent. I think it's also really important to think about how plausible deniability seems to work actually quite well in um, shielding those higher ups um, against criminal prosecution. And this, I think, comes from these muddied waters this ambiguity about who these units belong to, what kind of patches they wore, how they were financed, how they were run. Um, I really try to make the case um, in the book about what are some of those kind of elements that make plausible deniability um, quite successful. And just the very last point that I want to make is kind of to, to zoom out a little bit and to say that the archives of the ICTY and the mechanism are the most open set of archives that we have from war crimes trials. They are online, you can access them just with a valid email address, that's it. They're not necessarily um, very friendly to, you know, kind of regular uh, users, but they exist and, and they're quite accessible. And I would really like to make the argument for other institutions, the International Criminal Court, domestic courts in the former Yugoslavia or domestic courts in Ukraine one day to open as much of the archives as possible for research, um, because these are often the most detailed um, set of records that we have about this widespread um, violence. And it's incredibly important for posterity and, and for research and, and kind of for, for knowledge about these kinds of actors to um, really be able to, to use those materials uh, to study these kinds of perpetrators. I hope I'm okay on time and thank you so much for your attention and, and I'm eager to hear your thoughts and answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Riva. So, well, let me start with thanking the Harriman Institute and Tanya for this invitation. And I just want to start by saying that it's really a profound pleasure to assist in launching this book. There are many reasons, really numerous reasons. Firstly, it's a great book, no doubt about it, and we will get to talk about uh, its contribution in in the course of this conversation. But secondly, I've been known, I, 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 I knew the author for well over ten years, perhaps even fifteen years by now, and our roads cross professionally in numerous ways. And we had been, to use a Serbian idiom, she was a drug na drum, a friend along the way, and that way was a bit strange. It was a dual intent way. Uh, Eva was trying for quite a while to do the two, two things at the same time. On the one hand, to try to understand the extent and the scope of violence which had destroyed our former uh, motherland. And on the other hand, to try to see to which extent can it be prosecuted and whether some sort of accountability could be, uh, could be introduced in order to scrutinize these events. And given that we were both extremely vested in this dual intent, research on the one hand and accountability on the other hand, we were bound to see each other many times in many unusual locations. For instance, back in 2005 or six or so, I was a young intern in the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. And at that time, Eva was researching uh, and she was an analyst in the Bosnia war crimes court. A couple of years later, 2009 or so, Eva was working in a media watchdog organization called Sense, headquarters in the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, and she was probably the only person aside of Mirko Klarin, the head of that institution, who was actually observing all the trials at the same time, getting quite a unique insight into what's going on in that uh, under the roof of the ICTY. 
and I had switched to the uh, to be a researcher and an analyst in the Serbian war crimes tribunal. So much about our efforts to bring about some measure of accountability for these events. The other hand, we both got extremely interested in the academic scrutiny of this phenomenon, and that had caused, the, I think, certain tensions which we might discuss in the course of this conversation. Um, let me start by pointing out some of the things that this book does. Hmm. What accountability? This book was long in the making, and I know very much so how much sweat and tears indeed have come into this book. The fact that the book was long in the making was uh, not <laughs> due to Eva's procrastination. It was also through the judicial procrastination. To my mind, and Eva will prove me wrong if need be, it was really difficult to finish this book before some key trials, foremostly the trial against uh, Jovica Stanisic and Franko Simatovic, were finished because simply the book would be in the risk of being uh, uh, well put in, in, in a rather strange angle. So basically, Eva was following this trial uh, exactly like a war talk, but this was a never-ending judicial venture, postponing, in a sense, the publication of this book, but teaching us a lot about a limited amount of uh, accountability and the huge limitations when it comes to, uh, to dismissal of justice over the war crimes in general. Now... That being said, even if there was not really a huge effort in uh, holding uh, those, those responsible for war crimes accountable, uh, I still have to add that this book is certainly a, if I can use Mao Zedong's quote, a huge leap forward in our understanding of the phenomenon. This is a teamwork in a sense that many people are trying to do the same thing. And this is why I took a liberty to be a bit of a DJ in this conversation. And I was sending links to the books uh, which were emphasized by Eva, books by Hikmet Kartrich or by Christian Nielsen, because there are plenty of lonely individuals who vested almost their entire academic life in trying to understand what this phenomenon was all about. And Eva is certainly, certainly among those. Uh, it becomes a sort of a passion, if I may add. Uh, it's much more than, uh, than an occupation. It's simply a vocation. Now, what can we learn from Professor Vukushic's book? Really a number of things. I think this is uh, a first systematic study into firstly the evolution of paramilitary violence, different forms of paramilitary violence. It also gives a number of typologies. Uh, firstly, it gives a great overview of all the units which were involved in paramilitary violence, but also it tries to distinguish between different, uh, different ways of engagement and tries to distinguish between professionalized uh, paramilitary groups versus semi-professionalized or unprofessionalized or amateurish paramilitary groups. This is a really important distinction to, uh, to maintain, and I'm really uh, di directing everybody's attention to some definitional challenges which are uh, with which Shiva opens the book, trying to explain to us what is actually paramilitary. In many ways, it's a necessary but potentially misleading term. Paramilitary units are actually frequently engaged in parapolicing, and the way they are engaged in parapolicing actually is anything but policing and so on and so forth. So uh, I think uh, a book is an excellent empirical contribution to what we know and we do not know about the darker side, the darkest side of the Yugoslav wars, but it also helps a lot on a conceptual level, trying to uh, to shed some light on otherwise rather murky field of, of paramilitaries. Um, I know that there will be a number of questions from the audience, and I already saw that in the list of participants, there are people who are much better placed to comment on this book than myself. So I will try to keep my comments to a bare minimum. Yet I would like to bring about two major issues with a number of sub-issues um, attached to it. The first one has to, de has to do with the things, uh, with, with ethics and method. I think that writing of this book was extremely challenging, and the same goes for Hikmet's book, and the same goes for Nielsen's book, and the same goes for a couple of books that I never wrote, for, uh, and you will uh, understand why in a second. Uh, historians and uh, people who are in genocide studies are actually pretty much left on their own in terms of the ethical implications of their work. Unlike, for instance, anthropologists or sociologists who go undergo quite some training about what to do in their field and whose research has to pass through quite comprehensive advisory and ethical boards in order to be carried through for different reasons, on the other, we, I think, rather rely on our instincts, goodwill, um, well, conversation with other colleagues about what's proper and improper to do. 
How did we come to that? Well, simply because traditionally speaking, historians deal with dead people and they also deal with things which have, uh, which are bygones and with the information and archival material, which is sort of like in public access and uh, disclosed by the states. So simply it never dawned to anybody that history sped up and that majority of historians work in the field of contemporary history. And also that contemporary history is just as bloody as those previous histories were. So in a sense, we are sort of caught in between of let's say para policing or doing like the para forensic work, trying to undig uh, cases which are not dormant. M much of these cases are actually uh, still in different sorts of legal pipelines and with an attempt to be objective, academically partial uh, analysts of that position. That puts us in a really bizarre situation. And I wonder if this book is also a sort of a, a, a contribution to that end. I think Professor Vukushic tried very much so to be blunt about what she does and what she doesn't do. Uh, she wasted, uh, she, well, she put in quite some effort to show that she is not a tribunal instead of a tribunal. She made it abundantly clear that judgments at the ICTY and at local courts, which are, by the way, much more numerous, uh, are only of secondary importance to her. She consults them, but she doesn't use them as a primary source. What she uses as a primary source are the evidence which were introduced in those trials, which are juxtaposed to many other evidence or sources of information which are not used in those trials. And that's fair enough. However, it seems to me that certain parallel processing is simply unavoidable. Let me give you an example. The issue of command and control over the paramilitary, who actually organized them and to which degree they were supplied by a center, in this case, uh, by the leadership of the Serbian Security Service, uh, was the most contested issue in many trials. Again, case in, case in point being Stanisic and Simatovic trial. It was sold in different ways in different judgments in the Stanisic and Simatovic trial. Professor Vukushic, on the other hand, absolutely justifiably comes to her own conclusion in regard to who was the boss there. The word boss, by the way, is very frequently used in her book. And I find it extremely interesting when one thinks about the ecology of paramilitarism, which is the term introduced by Professor Vukushic, which I will happily steal and endorse and broadcast and quote, of course. Uh, in this ecology, the idea of a boss, I think, is a very important one, of this kind of like semi-official overlord for whom the actual ID is not really the most important thing. What's written on your business card does not necessarily reflect the actual power you have over these people. Anyhow, that was the bone of contention in those trials. And this was the bone of contention in, in Professor Vukushin's book. So my first question would be, how do you deal with this parallelism? How to be a judge or to avoid being a judge instead of a judge in that respect? So that's one question. On the ethical plane, there is also a sub-question to this question. Uh, this book relies on extensive documentary material. The documents are coming from governmental sources. The, co the documents are coming from investigative journalism pieces, which I have to emphasize had been abundant and extremely brave. In many ways, the skeleton of this story about paramilitarism was, uh, was emerging exactly during the, uh, the time that violence had occurred. And I'm using the opportunity simply to acknowledge the work of these brave people, Ana Anastasievich, Vasic, many, many others uh, who were risking their lives actually to bring about these first fresh insights about, uh, about the paramilitary. Yet, uh, there are a number of documents which are used uh, in the trials. Um, there are statements given by a number of witnesses, including uh, including the inside witnesses. A couple of insights given by Goran Stoparic and a couple of other people who were partaking in paramilitary units and were in close proximity to violence, to me, are indispensable if we want to learn uh, and to understand the phenomenon better. Professor Vukovic mentioned just a minute ago that we always have to be aware of the limits of our knowledge. And in her book also, she quotes Strauss on the matter that there are certain limitations. And now I wonder, Professor Vukushic, um, what is to your mind the best way to approach, uh, to approach the perpetrators, to study them? How does one do that? And not only perpetrators, but given that most of those, uh, those cases uh, were not bring, brought to a logical end, what do we do with the alleged perpetrators or people who were in close proximity to, to violence, which is such a mass phenomenon? Um, to, to give an example, what would you do if uh, Jovica Stanisic contacted you one of these days when the book is completely out and he said, oh, look, Eva, I just read your book and I mean, I need to tell you I'm a sadly misunderstood man and I want to give you my side of the story. 
what does Eva do? Uh, or in the case which is uh, uh, which is probably more realistic, what does one do when one encounters a person who is perhaps a perpetrator and certainly a valuable source uh, to our understanding of the matter? So to put it bluntly, where does the police work end and where does the scholarly work uh, begin? That's like the first mega question with a couple of, couple of sub-questions. The other mega question with a couple of sub-questions has to do with the outreach of Eva's book. Eva's book is absolutely indispensable for anybody who wants to find out uh, about the collapse of former Yugoslavia and the war in the former Yugoslavia and the war crimes committed in the course of that war. Those are the three main tiers where this book will definitely be a pillar. However, I posit here that this book will be absolutely uh, of extreme use to all those who want to study paramilitary violence any, anywhere else. And unfortunately, there is no shortage of these examples, Syria, Libya, Ukraine, a number of places in South America still. Um, and then I wonder to which degree this concept of ecology, of paramilitarism uh, can be seen in a flux. Professor Vukusic concluded her book by mentioning some of these examples, and she is asking a question, and now I'm basically asking this question back to her, to which degree there is a learning curve? Are those people and those organizations studying all these examples and are trying to apply them, to adjust them, to improve when they are venturing in this direction? To make the question more concrete, uh, at the beginning of her book, Professor Vukusic was also trying to give us a certain genealogy of paramilitarism in the Balkans, dwelling also on a number of situations from the 19th and 20th century, which contributed to this ecology of uh, violent political culture in the Balkans. And that's uh, an absolutely valid point. However, I could not but note uh, that Professor Vukusic didn't really decide to, to, to venture too much into the activities of the Yugoslav Secret Service during the Cold War. And these activities, as she mentioned, were quite unsavory. However, if one would go into details, one would see that the bulk of the activities of Yugoslav Secret Service uh, was based on contracting criminals for different sorts of clandestine activities, including, including murders. This is a relatively well-known phenomenon, recently also described in Professor Nielsen's book on Tito's assassins. Uh, and given that some of those assassins, or alleged assassins, because we don't really know uh, in details, uh, turned out to be paramilitary warlords such as Arkan. I wonder what made you decide not to uh, pursue that, uh, that uh, area of research further, especially given that since 2014, actually, as you yourself write in the conclusion of your book, whoever looks into what's happening in Eastern Ukraine uh, and also in Crimea, it was really easy to discern certain patterns and uh, one keeps asking oneself, okay, are those people reading the same playbook? Uh, or is it simply the situation of uh, great minds uh, coming to the same, the same conclusions, right? Uh, I simply wonder to which degree we can responsibly compare these cases, given that most of these things happen in complete secrecy. That's the trouble in our work, right? So on the one hand, we want to explain, we want to understand. On the other hand, we are completely aware that we are uh, uh, constrained by the clandestine nature of that work, and then those people who would be able to tell us more or less, to, to give a response to this question, are either indicted, or they are protected witnesses, or they are simply professional liars. I bet you that uh, General Vasilievich would be able to tell us if there is a playbook which is somehow circulating through the Eastern Bloc or Eastern and Western Bloc, but I also bet you that he has no interest in explaining to us how is this actually, actually playing out. So basically, to which degree we can globalize, let's say, this ecology. Professor Vukuric was also uh, partaking in an extremely ambitious project spearheaded by Professor Ungor uh, of University of Amsterdam, in which they were trying to, uh, to take a look at the global uh, landscape of this, uh, of this ecology, hence, hence this question. Or uh, the same sub, the sub question of the same question pertains to transformations of uh, of this, let's say, top paramilitary unit, the Red Berets, which transformed into unit for special operations. One wonders when this transformation took form, 95, 96, 97, and when this etatization, let's say, or attempt at etatization of paramilitarism uh, was, was at stake. So <laughs> what were the uh, role models? Was it the French Legion from which uh, the commander was actually coming from? 
or did one have uh, South American death squads in mind, given that basically this unit did end up in this cartel cooperation and was at the same time uh, they were they were basically Pretorians of uh, of Milosevic. So I simply wonder what can we actually compare uh, in a responsible way. One last final thought before we give it to the audience, but then I'm ready to come back with plenty of, uh, of additional questions, uh, is pertaining to plausible uh, de deniability. I wonder to which degree that deniability was actually plausible. I think that many of these units uh, were facing a rather ambiguous situation. Much of their activity was criminal, and there is such a chilling chapter in Professor Vukosic's book, which actually describes what did those people do. It's difficult to read those pages uh, with, a, with, a, with a cold, objective, impartial, uh, impartial demeanor. Um, so on the one hand, there was a need for secrecy. On the other hand, there was certainly a need to advertise one's activities in order to compete with other groups, in order to uh, boost one's morale, in order to instill fear. To put it in simple terms, nobody would be afraid of Arkan if they didn't know who Arkan was. So basically, like every criminal organization, in a sense, they were playing on a rather tight rope. Uh, of, and and uh, it's a complicated thing to be a PR master of, uh, of a paramilitary organization. So that being said, it seems to me that this, uh, this plausible deniability is possible as long as nobody wants to do anything serious about it. It's my impression that uh, the reason why uh, why Serbian government was successful in clouding its uh, its hold over Arkan's unit, for instance, was also that in the West, there wasn't really a determined idea to do something about it. So in a sense, I fear that the ecology of paramilitarism is much more global than we actually think. It's not necessarily that those are some savages from the Balkans or, you know, like some druggies from uh, bad hombres, as, uh, as former President Trump liked to call them, uh, are partaking in this global ecology for different reasons. It seems to me that there is indeed global environment in which impunity plays a huge role and some token actions are done instead of actually doing something about it. And only in such environment, such thin veil of implausible deniability actually uh, has effect because basically whatever the government needs is to change a couple of patches and then that brings everybody in the clear. That, uh, that brings about this situation in which, well, we can't really say who's controlling these people and the situation in the ground is unclear and we don't know what to do about it. So it seems to me that uh, basically this uh, zoo, if you wish, uh, is, 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 is much more encompassing than we would care to think. Now, on that positive note, I would really like to take the back seat and to see what the audience has to say. But again, I'm ready to return and I will happily serve as the DJ as long as we stay here. Eva, Professor Vukusic, thank I you so much here. for this contribution. I am, I am back. Can you hear me? Absolutely. Absolutely. Really yeah. apologize. <laughs> I, I apologize immensely. Um, and of course, it's never happened before. Uh, let me just say this. Uh, thank you. I'm sure you're, I, I just heard the last of your comments, Vladimir, very interesting. Uh, right now, I don't see anything in the chat. There's, wait a minute. In the um, Q&A, I see something. Uh, yeah, okay, I do say something. Um, it's from Anna Villamina Verd Verdnik. Uh, dear Eva, thank you for your presentation. Truly impressive. Do you observe any common characteristics of ex-fighters who return to political violence slash organized crime mercenaries chose to delink and become civilians? Is the faith of ex-fighters mostly explained by differences between groups, or do you observe that that differences within groups no matter as well, to matter as well? Excuse me. Thank you. Do you want me to, to take that uh, first then? Um, yes. Thank, yes. 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 So, thank you. Because it's thank directed you. to you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anna, for your um, question. I think to a certain extent, and I, I think Vlada will agree, um, we don't know so much about what happened to rank and file after the war, because of course it was not in the state's interest to collect and in any way publicize this kind of information. Um, and also because of course we have heard and, and were able to follow, you know, quote unquote, the careers of, of some um, of the kind of more principal, more important members 
uh, such as Legia or you know, people who were involved in the Jinjic murder. But apart from that, we don't really know much um, about what happened to many of these uh, members later. Actually, early on when I was talking to the journalists that uh, Vlada so rightfully mentioned, uh, uh, Anastasievich, Filip Schwarm, uh, uh, Vasic, all of these people who, people who follow Serbian investigative journalism on these topics for you know, 20, 30 years would know. Um, we discussed the possibility of, of, you know, looking what would be some of these sources and what would be possible for me as a woman who, when sh she speaks, speaks with a distinct Croatian accent, what, what would that do also to, or a Zagreb accent, I should say, what would that do to potential interactions? And one of the things that I think it was Dejan uh, uh, Lejdana Sosijevic who, um, uh, who said this to me was that, um, for the most part, those who talk publicly don't know, and those who know don't talk. And I wonder if Vlada would uh, agree with that. So to a certain extent, a lot of this kind of grassroots um, kind of investigations um, are really difficult. Um, and, and so I think, and as I write in the book as well, some of the members of the Special Operations Unit after they killed Jinjic and after Operation Sabra and all of this upheaval that happened, some of them were judged as kind of safe and integrated in other special kinds of units um, within the Ministry of Internal Affairs or different kinds of security arrangements. Um, and it was the, the other ones kind of quietly uh, dismissed uh, or entered, you know, fully organized crime circles um, and, and alike. I, I wish I had more uh, to say uh, uh, on this issue, but like a rank and file kind of survey, what happened to these people, it's hard to, to, to make. I think a lot of them also just kind of came from insignificance in some way and then went back into it as well, into some kind of anonymity, some kind of, you know, marginalized existence in the sense that I imagine some of them were also wounded and struggling financially in the aftermath as well. So not, I think not all of them kind of benefited from the crime and, and from the social mobility that this world allowed uh, for a while. I think some very much returned to the same kind of um, un unprivileged sort of positions that they had before. I wonder if Lada maybe also has a thought or two to, to offer there. Of course, yes. Yeah, uh, very shortly, uh, even though, of course, we can't tell with uh, uh, with precision, certainly somebody knows. Professor Vukusic in her book uh, mentioned one interesting operation of the Serbian security, uh, uh, state security called Operation Thompson. Now, what was Operation Thompson? Uh, the state, and that brings me to the core of uh, something that we might discuss actually here, because it wasn't, Eva didn't task herself with that, but I find it extremely interesting. Who makes the paramilitary? Is it the weak state or is it the strong state? Mm -hmm. Or is it basically that we under theorized the notion of weak and strong state vis-a-vis -vis the paramilitary? Why on earth would a state which tried so much to regain this monopoly over legitimate uh, use of force, this is this classical definition, why would the state abandon this monopoly and use semi-private agents allocating them such enormous amount of power at such huge expense? Professor Vukusic's book opens with the assassination of Serbian prime minister, which was the direct consequence of this uh, state relegating the power, the license to kill to people of rather dubious, uh, dubious reputation. So this is for me the question of all the questions, not only for Serbia, for everybody. I mean, we all know what happened with outsourcing similar authority to Cubans uh, in, the, in, the, in the 1960s. Um, and it's related both to Watergate to a number of other murky, murky situations. So it's an extremely tricky business, which means that some of these people are operating in obscurity, but they are of immense importance. Uh, and Operation Thompson was an attempt of Serbian Secret Service to understand who does what who has still uh, uh, illegal weapons, for instance, uh, and so on. So I'm rather convinced that somebody out there is keeping a tab on those people. Um, we find it out only circumstantially. For instance, there was one trial to the paramilitary in Serbia that Eva is quoting a lot in her book. It's a trial of, uh, uh, of Scorpios. Uh, the reason why Scorpios were brought to justice so quickly uh, and they were brought to justice literally overnight, was that they were under surveillance of Serbian police for quite a while. So it was easy to pick them up. That, of course, begs for a number of other questions. Why aren't other people picked up? 
we know where they are. I can tell you for some people, I would never, you know, when I was younger and more foolish, I was telling names and locations and whatnot and kind of putting target on people's heads without knowing 100% that they are what they think they are. I think now this is not okay, so I don't do it anymore. Uh, but I can tell you that like a given guy who uh, was not only a paramilitary, but was also in torturing people is, I don't know, distributing drugs now in suburbs of Belgrade. Prior to that, he was a DJ in a nightclub and stuff like that. But those are peripheral cases. My fear is that those who were the decision makers or who were uh, in the need uh, uh, deeper are simply still in significant power positions. Uh, mind you, we know so much about perpetration in the field. Eva wrote about it immensely. We know so much about recruitment. Eva wrote about it immensely. What we know scarily not enough about is who paid for the damn thing. Okay, the state paid for the damn thing. We know that up until degree. But there were private enterprises which were either racketeered or were willingly financing this activity. Um, I imagine that they were also benefiting from looting uh, committed by those units. So they are enormously important part of this ecology, and we don't know a lot about it. We don't know a lot about it because there weren't as many investigations into economic aspect of war crimes. And that would probably lead us to industrialists, bankers, reputed members of the society. I don't know. I don't know because we didn't try. And that's actually something that uh, that is underexplored. If there is a student out there interested in going in that direction, we'll find him a bullet or her a bulletproof vest and they can continue where we stopped. Uh, but still, Eva, I would like to, to reiterate, imagine we have students. Imagine we have legions of students who want to smoke those things out. What would you advise them to do and not to do, especially in regard to communicating with potential perpetrators? Right, right. Yeah, no, um, I, uh, if, if uh, uh, I may just uh, return to, to a couple of points that Lada was making, which I think were, as, as people think, potentially for other questions and then maybe uh, Tanya can, can look and, and, and we can maybe take Viriana's point. But of course, as I was preparing for today's event, some things that Lada said I anticipated or sort of anticipated, some kind of completely caught me off guard and maybe shouldn't. For example, the question, would I meet Jovic Stanisic if he invited me for, um, for coffee? Um, of course, we have to sort of think on our feet. So maybe my answer in two days time would be different, but I think I would probably say yes. Now, what are some what are some uh, factors that that would go in? It's the same kind of, I think, idea that I have when I engage with people on Twitter, for example. I engage with people with whom I disagree as long as we live on the same planet when it comes to facts. So I won't discuss have murders happened after the fall of Srebrenica. It's just it's a waste of time. So if I would be in a situation where I would be able to discuss based on some factual, uh, shared factual notion with some of these people, I think I would, uh, in the name of kind of discovery and knowledge. Does that make me feel comfortable about it? Am I certain of my choice? No, I'm not. So it's, it's a very difficult situation. Would I send my students to, you know, young PhDs to search and, and study Serbian state security and ties to private kind of financial interest? I, I, I would really probably not. Um, and I would seek um, extensive advice um, of senior colleagues who I would hope would say, don't do it. Um, because it's different to risk your own um, you know, self and, and it's different to send you know, some kind of young person under your care, so to say, uh, out there in the field. Um, and I absolutely agree. I mean, the point that you were making about like navigating this in terms of ethics, but also in terms of law, for example, early on, I was also talking to some of the journalists in Serbia. Should I talk to some of these people? Should I not? There's an entire world of, you know, the obligation to report if you hear about a crime in a certain conversation, right? So it's it's just potentially putting people uh, in all kinds of, of uh, dangerous or, or uncomfortable situation, myself, my interlocutors, who may or may not be involved in this world. So I think it's really, really complicated. And I would actually invite all of us collectively uh, who study perpetrators to try to think of some of the ways in which we can make our lives a little bit easier so that we don't all need to reinvent the wheel every single time that we're studying uh, some of these uh, things. Um, and I think that's actually a, an excellent uh, point um, to, to, to make. Uh, and just one more point uh, that, that you were referring to, do these perpetrators learn from one another? 
I don't know, but it's kind of too similar to be an accident in my mind um, in, in some ways. For example, just things that we superficially see um, that, that relate to Wagner, for example. Now, this is, you know, this is not my expertise, but I read extensively on it. In some ways, it seems like it's Red Berets 2.0 to me, like a better, more improved, fancier version of what we saw in the former Yugoslavia. Uh, so it seems like there's also a certain development uh, there as well. Similar recruitments from, you know, economically deprived areas, going to prisons, you know, martial arts kind of people as well. So there's just these echoes that seem like, I don't know if there's a, a blueprint, but it kind of seems like there's some set of ideas that, that somehow circulate. Um, and, and I would love to research it, but in terms of a research plan, I'm not sure how one would actually, like actually go about it <laughs> to, to, to try to make this into, um, into a research uh, sort of uh, project. But yeah, very, very good, very good points. And I'm sad to say that I don't have uh, satisfactory answers to uh, maybe to, to some of those. Okay, we do have a few questions here. Uh, outstanding. One is from uh, Mirana Gav uh, Gavriel Lovett Nielsen. She asks you, uh, Eva, uh, could you, what could you say about the relationships between the municipal government structure, i.e. crisis staffs, war, presidency, Serb municipal assemblies, and paramilitary units, and also did this relationship differ across municipalities? For example, did the level of collaboration coordination differ? Um, very good point. Thank you, Mirena, for coming and for asking this question. Um, as an absolute answer, I don't know because I simply have not had the capacity and the time to look into all of these municipalities at the local level. And this is also something that I would invite scholars who are interested in this to extend the research and go into that direction at the very local level. I think, and, and I wonder also what others uh, think, but we have micro studies and Vlada has written some as well on Vienna, but there's micro studies on, on Prieder to a certain extent, some on Visegrad, but overall we don't really at the local level, we don't really know what happened to the kind of the, the, the level of detail um, uh, when it comes to paramilitaries, but also other uh, perpetrators. So I think this is really the next step to try to explain differences between uh, municipalities. My sense would also be that some of it also had to do with just personalities, who was in a job, who was the chief of police at the time, who was you know, the, 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 the local leadership and, and how kind of bloodthirsty and cruel they were. Um, and in sort of their own uh, tensions and, and power struggles at the, at the local level. Um, so um, I, I'm hoping that that's, um, because th this kind of research I think can be done as well in the ICTY uh, records. Um, and, and, and doesn't necessarily need to be risky in, in the same way that some of the stuff that, that Vlada and I were talking about just a, a moment ago. So I, ho I hope that answers at least a little bit of the question. Okay. Um, we have a comment and a question from Kurt Bassinger. Um, he says his question relates to where are they now element? Um, there were paramilitary alumni in Congo hired by Mo Mobutu in, the, in his last days, one wonders if any gravitated to Eastern Ukraine, and in the former case, if this undergirds Dr. Petrovich's point that there is some Western complicity in the case, French, passive or active. Very interesting comment and question. Eva, start with you and then to Vlada. Yes, I, I know of at least, I mean, I, I followed some strands of this and, and, uh, and I have at least one guy who we can follow from um, Queens, New York, through Grbavica and Sarajevo in 1994 to uh, Ukraine, where he has been outspoken as, as kind of a, a volunteer. Um, and uh, he uh, lived there as well. Um, Zak Novakovic, I think, as well. Many of the people who followed ICTY trials will remember this video where he is interviewed and he speaks in kind of uh, American New York sort of accent to a reporter about what the hell he's doing in Grbavica uh, in, in Sarajevo. So it's not quite clear to me what exactly he ended up doing in Ukraine. I think there's also, to a certain extent, a little bit of um, danger that just because of the fact that he's there, we assume that he is in some way crucial or important or fighting. Um, I, I think some of it might also be that people just move in, in social circles in, in, in certain territories, but there are definitely links 
And I have read as well that um, people who joined Wagner from Serbia, uh, there is at least credible um, uh, suspicion that some of them carry this experience from the, the former Yugoslavia in the 1990s. And then now, of course, they're older, so maybe they're not running uh, around fighting themselves, but they could be involved in training. Um, so again, I think this, is, this would be a fruitful um, avenue for, for research to kind of pick up and, and see beyond Zach Novakovic, who, who else uh, and, and kind of what their pathways um, have been uh, to other areas as well, to Ukraine, but also to Wagner or potentially other places as well. Vlada, what's your, what's your take uh, here? Yeah, no, I completely agree. That would be really fruitful, but unfortunately, there's going to be probably one of those many excellent non-written books, unless it's an edited volume of a couple of interesting biographies like Karkans or Girkins, Girkin Strelko. He uh, had been in Bosnia most probably during the uh, Bosnia and almost probably in Visegrad, which was a place of horrible atrocities uh, described by Professor Vukusic, but the actual connection needs to be researched in details, and I wonder to which degree it can be reconstructed. Why do we see similar faces and similar events? Again, probably great minds think alike, you know, and basically there are people who actually love that stuff. Uh, there was an excellent book of a, war, a wartime reporter called Lloyd, uh, called uh, My War Had Gone By, I Miss It I miss So, it so yeah. which, con which conveys this, uh, this, this atmosphere uh, with adrenaline-driven people. Uh, on the other hand, uh, people who kill in cold blood uh, and who are functional enough to last for a couple of decades are relatively rare, and fortunately so. And that made people like Arkan, I frequently wondered why did Serbian state smeared itself so much by, uh, by throwing the dice in his direction? Well, actually, it's probably quite commonsensical. You see, he when you tell him kill, he doesn't ask why, but whom. Uh, and there are not so many people who do that. And secondly, he doesn't drink. He's fairly punctual and he can do stuff. So what I mean to say is that such people are a relative asset. So I think they move with apparent ease uh, from, from the battleground to battleground, even from service to service, even not being shy to serve in another group. This was the frequent case in the former Yugoslavia where language barrier was not a problem. Yuka Prazina, a couple of other people who had been happily working for, uh, let's say, Bosniak side and then switching to Croat side and so on and so forth, or one should never underestimate the power of transnational network of these people. Organized crime is almost by definition transnational, at least a successful organized crime. These people are always dipping, with, at least with one finger, they are dipped into the organized crime. A case in point, for instance, uh, a guy who basically organized Genesis assassination, uh, Legia, the Legion, who was heading unit for special operation, he went underground. He was the most wanted man at the time, at least in the Balkans. He just went underground, and now we know that uh, in this process he was given a passport by uh, by the Croats, or better to say, by the Croatian authorities within Bosnia. It's a very complex story, but uh, it shows us that the person who potentially or theoretically should have been hated tremendously uh, by uh, <coughs> by some people was given happily a passport by those same people. Also, it's not a coincidence that many of these key figures in this world have complete impunity, sometimes from several sides. Take this Arkan guy. I think the name is known to most of the audience. He was arrested before the war or, you know, near the beginning of the war. He was arrested and put to trial in Zagreb. He was in prison for two or three months and so. And I mean, what did he get? Suspended sentence. Then he reappeared in Belgrade and he became uh, what he became. How and why? It is kind of, we get to know snippets of it at a certain point. But uh, yeah, there are networks which, which easily go beyond uh, beyond uh, beyond the borders. And uh, what does it actually mean? Well, sometimes it means nothing. Uh, in 2014, there was an influx of volunteers from the Balkans uh, into Crimea and into Donetsk and into Lugansk. And as if following some old pattern, you know, like an old war horse, uh, the Croats were going for the Ukrainian side and not any Ukrainian side. They would go unmistakably to Azov Battalion or other, uh, other let's say, right, uh, right wing uh, uh, political and military associations, whereas the Serbs would go for the Russian side, but they didn't last long. They didn't last long because a lot of it had changed in the nature of warfare. So basically, you know, uh, with all these lasers and whatnot, uh, having people who are like in their 50s now and uh, they're happy to just go around and drink uh, and, and, you know, talk stuff, 
they were not so useful. So ultimately, this time it didn't work. So this ecology is also very dynamic. And one of the main contributions of Professor Vukushic's book is that she shows that there is a constant flux. That's something she insists on uh, on every other page, that basically these relations are dynamic and they need to be looked, uh, looked at uh, uh, in, this, in this dynamic mode. Very interesting. We have another comment from Andy, who's in Indo uh, Edinburgh. He has uh, directed this to you, uh, Eva. Would you say, um, he said, I'm still reading your book uh, so far. Um, it's meeting his expectations. And his question is, would you say the data favors knowing the more structured form of irregular violent actors over more fleeting ephemeral forms of organizing uh, irregular violence and following up to Vlado's just pertinent comment. Yeah, very, very interesting question. Thank you, Andy. I think to a certain extent, and again, I, I, I also always kind of look to, to Vlad as well to kind of see what what uh, what he thinks about the issue. But I think to a certain extent, that's the consequences of the nature of sources, right? Because in the investigation for war crimes, the prosecutors, the investigators, they're looking for something that is more than a witness testimony, because these can be, of course, notoriously kind of unstable and, and, and changing. So, and I think if there is a structure behind a kind of a perpetrating uh, you know, a unit or, or a group of people, then there might be documents, there might be some kind of, you know, a more permanent um, features that you can sort of, you know, grasp. Um, if you, especially if these things are semi-legal or legal, that there's also some kind of, you know, law or statute that says something about them. And I think that kind of stuff is just much easier to bring to court than more maybe kind of fluid as ephemeral as, as, as you call them, or, or, you know, kind of more, I guess, spontaneous kind of very local micro level um, uh, instances of, of violence. And, and, and as I talk in my book as well, I think there's a, also a, a a, a high number of, of instances of individual acts of violence that we don't know about simply because no one survived, no one investigated, it never came to court. So it's, it's a whole, you know, I, I wrote a book based on what's there, um, which is to say that there's probably a whole bunch of, of things that, that um, I missed because they missed from the sources. And I think these kinds of uh, maybe more spontaneous or, or less organized kind of forms of, of violence maybe fall into, into, into that category. I actually have a comment and observation. I'd like both of you to respond. Um, I'm happy, I happen to be going to Kosovo this week. Uh, I'll be discussing sexual violence during conflict. And what I'm seeing in Ukraine um, may or may not fall under the irregular forces. But what you do see is it's mainstream through the regular army. And uh, the UN report that just came out said that soldiers are being issued Viagra as an example of how things have advanced since the uh, Bosnia and Kosovo wars. And um, uh, at least to the, the current evidence that's available, there aren't rape camps, but who knows, you know, maybe it will be revealed later. I don't know. What, what are your thoughts on that? And what I'm also observing just globally is just the unbelievable explosion of sexual violence in almost every single war, particularly the ones that are ethnic based uh, in the last 30 years in what's happening in Ethiopia at this moment is, is like of, you know, medieval period. So I would love to have both your, your comments with you, Eva, please. Sure. Um, just a couple of thoughts on, on sexual violence. Of course, I, um, I think there's a couple of things happening here at the same time. First, in, in scholarly communities or generally in research and, and kind of advocacy circles, this issue of sexual violence against uh, women and girls, but also I would say uh, men and boys, has yes. exploded in interest in the last 20 years. We have seen more attention to it than maybe many of the other kind of issues kind of combined. Um, so I think just the, the, the enhanced interest and in research also of course generates a lot of you know, investigative reporting and, and, and mm -hmm. all of that. So I think to a certain extent, that's an effort of us knowing more about what's out there in the world because it's a, it's a hot kind of a topic as a, a lack of a, a better word. 
Notoriously, of course, sexual violence is underreported in times of peace, in times of war, um, for various reasons, stigma being being one of them. So I, I suspect in this also case, there will be in the future more details coming out. And um, I, I am certain because I've also read that cases of sexual violence are also um, kind of ubiquitous as, uh, as, as they were in the former Yugoslavia. But I think in the former Yugoslavia, we also saw that, and I read a little bit about it in the book as well, that not all the units engaged in this kind of violence um, in the same way, right? So for example, uh, Lukic's unit around Visegrad was well known for uh, this kind of, uh, this, this, uh, kind of uh, violence. So it's also very difficult to bring to court, um, I think, especially to try to prosecute those up the chain of, because no one is an idiot. No one is going to write a memo saying, please go rape everyone. Thank you very much, stamp and sign. Um, it just doesn't work like that. So these kinds of things are, I think, quite difficult to prove in court. So here we're also going to, I think, see in the in the years to come, given all the attention on Ukraine, how how um, investigative bodies, different kinds, are going to are going to go about uh, investigating it. But indeed, if this is the case that soldiers are given um, Viagra, then it does indicate an organized approach to perpetration, not just just kind of something that you know happens, but that it's very much a purposeful uh, uh, sort of policy, uh, at least for the parts of those um, those units that are active there. Thank you, Vlado. Yes, I, I've been thinking. I mean, we knew for a long while that uh, rape is a weapon of war and that it's implemented sometimes haphazardly and sometimes strategically. And again, because of the issue of underreporting, it's kind of difficult to say how strategic this strategic implementation is. Um, I come from a culture where uh, a woman has extreme problems stepping up and saying that she is raped. And for a male to say that he had been raped during the war, it's next to unthinkable, actually. And uh, that makes me wonder if this surge in, 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 in rape, which we see all over the world, uh, is it the surge in, uh, which, which indicates change of tactique? Or is it simply that people are feeling more free to say what had happened yeah. to them? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, uh, it, uh, because the rape had been... Uh, criminalized as a war crime only during the activity of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. I mean, you know, <laughs> one can say this or that about that tribunal. I keep fighting with myself over that issue, as I'm certain Eva does as well. But some of the things, for instance, integrating rape as a crime which is not subject to statute of limitation because it's also a war crime, belongs to the judicial legacy of that um, of that institution. Um, unfortunately, this could not prevent, as we can see, uh, uh, rape mm -hmm. happening in the case of war uh, throughout the world, but perhaps, perhaps uh, people understand that it's not their fault that they had been raped, which is something that patriarchal culture unfortunately keeps uh, instilling into uh, into them. It, it's an extremely, extremely uh, uh, tough topic. Yes. Uh, on another topic, which was raised uh, a moment ago, uh, uh, one other thing that Professor Vukushi's book complicates, and for, rightfully so. Um, we should probably get rid of this simplification, paramilitary bad, military good, oh, yeah, uh, absolutely. volunteers bad, uh, police good or something like that. No, no, not at all. The war brings about inverted reality in which uh, law and order, let's say, organizations all of a sudden are becoming, you know, mayhem and disorder organizations. And it can happen that your life is safer in the hand of X epsilon paramilitary unit than with the colonel of the most regular uh, army in the world. It happened in Bosnia on the regular. Uh, uh, to give an example, very early in the war, General Madic, the overlord of uh, Serbian forces, concluded that the paramilitary are awful, bad, undisciplined, drunk. Uh, even uh, his, his intelligence commander, Tolimir, famously said that uh, they are the carriers of genocidal tendencies in Serbian people. And that brought about an order by General Mladic that all the paramilitary units should either uh, be subordinated to the military units or they should just uh, be kicked out of Bosnia. In reality, sometimes this subordination happened and sometimes it did not. Whether it was a power struggle within the system or whether it was a genuine attempt to get rid of these unsavory elements of paramilitary, I don't know. But what I can see is that basically if you want to swallow the paramilitary, most probably the organization which swallows them is going to take this ethics as well. However, it's unclear uh, uh, whether the paramilitary actually are always necessarily 
uh, of worse contact, uh, contact than the regulars. Why is it unclear? Not only that we don't know, um, you know, we are really scratching the surface. And Eva is really brave enough. I mean, I know how it is when you write the book, you have the tendency, especially this book needs to be published, right? So nobody would want to publish a book saying like, we are scratching over the surface here and whatever mm -hmm. I know is really conditional. And I wonder- But it's absolutely right true. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it, 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 it's tough, right? So people want to hear some definite contributions. Uh, Eva is bold enough to basically say, no, we don't really know. Uh, the trials are indispensable, but they are really small keyholes. Through these small keyholes, really strong light comes. And this light tells us a lot, but it's also blinding us. It can be that there are some other keyholes which are not open and we do not really understand the, uh, the actual extent or we don't really see you know, for instance, who benefited from all that violence. Eva mentions so much economic transfer which was happening there. At some moment in Sarajevo, not one, not two, 3,000 vehicles had been stolen in an organized way. And we know that they were stolen. We don't know where they ended up. Yeah. Uh, we know that many people were uh, paying quite some sums of money to get out of concentration camps at a certain point. Uh, who benefited, right? Uh, so these are all these things that we don't know. And again, I would like to reiterate this question to Eva about being a judge instead of a judge. Oh, yeah. uh, and basically, what do we do in such circumstances uh, uh, where we rely heavily on the evidence? The same evidence was presented to Eva when she was writing to her book and to the trial chamber, for instance, uh, uh, which was uh, which was deliberating on, on, on the responsibility of heads of Serbian secret service. They came up with one conclusion. Eva is coming up with another conclusion in completely other genre with completely other implications. Uh, plus, uh, to make things even more complicated, they had a better overview of the evidence because the chamber always has the power to redact the evidence. And Eva was for years, again, this book was in the making for such a long time because she couldn't finish it because the trials were not ended. And then instead of some revelation, you get like a statement, it's quoted in her book, Jovica Stanisic, the wartime boss of the Secret Service. And the statement goes as follows. I, Jovica Stanisic, was always a redacted, redacted. Uh, in the course of which I redacted, redacted, redacted. <laughs> so basically, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, so how do we go about that, Professor Lukosic? Yeah, it's a great question. And this is actually one question that I, I, I mean, I, I, I thought about it, but not framed quite like that. Um, I think I can offer just snippets of my thoughts on this, sadly, but maybe one day we, we can take it up in a more organized way, maybe within a framework of what we we're just discussing to try to think as a community of researchers, how do we go about this? But I think the older I get, the more I try to feel less. I, I, how, how should I say that? Less investment in the outcome. Of course, I, I am curious about what will happen with, with Jovica and Frankie, but in order to safeguard my ability to analyze, I try to not be particularly emotionally invested either way. And that is tough. And in my 20s, I failed consistently <laughs> in all of those efforts. Uh, but as I get older, I really try to, try to not think of it as judgment. Also, because first of all, it's not my job. It's not something that I'm trained for. To also, I, I don't have any ethical higher ground to be dispensing, you know. Uh, I, I just like, who were these people and what were they doing? That's all that I care about. Um, and, and when you think of it like that, I think it releases some of the pressure to, you know, like to judge. Then also, I remind myself also what you were just saying, like, I could look at this much because of volume, but also because of confidentiality of some, some key um, issues as well. So I think that to a certain extent helps a little bit with this pressure to, to be a judge in some way. And also ultimately because hundreds of people have been discussing the judgment of some of these people for three decades. Like who am I to come, come out with the one and final you know, kind of uh, assessment? So I think all of those things just, just helped me lower the bar of what I was doing. I don't come out and say, yo, it says guilty or Frankie is guilty or this guy's guilty or that guy's not guilty. That's not how I approach it as well. It was just like who these people were and what the hell were they doing and, and why. So, so maybe that, and, and for me, that, that was satisfactory as, as, as a process and, and I could kind of keep myself uh, uh, doing that. But I, I wonder if other people just in these kinds of communities of people who study researchers, would, is this something that would resonate or, or do people have different strategies? 
Um, we have a question uh, from Pete, well, not a question, a comment from Petar Fincy, who I know from his work at uh, doing communications for the for um, ICTI um, after it was concluded in terms of education. So he makes the point, and it's really, it's true. In fact, rape was defined as crime against humanity in the Control Council Law Number 10 in 1946. This is for Nuremberg, but no charges were brought against any defendants charged pursuant to that law. That so is it wasn't true. actually operationalized That's until right. the 1990s. Sort of it existed as, right. as, as on paper, but it didn't really... Right. And, and that, and actually, the first case on rape was was prosecuted by R the Rwanda Tribunal Akaseu, uh, where rape was determined to be a component of genocide. So, just to set the just little minor details, but thank you, Petar, for your comment. We oh, actually, these details are absolutely crucial. I happily stand. I mean, unhappily, I wish we talked about something else, but I stand absolutely corrected and huge hi to Peter. Uh, he's a treasure trove of knowledge. Uh, but uh, there, <laughs> there is a thing here which is probably also quite important. Does the law, especially international law, actually really have some sort of prescriptive? Uh, does it inhibit the perpetrators? Right. So do they really read those things? Uh, and are they really interested in that? In theory, we all hoped that basically, uh, you know, putting things on paper, having Roma statute, uh, having this or having that would somehow, somehow remind warlords that they are not beyond the hand of the law, or at least they should moderate their behavior. But it seems to me that by now we have empirical uh, data that that doesn't happen. That like leading 200,000 people under arms puts you in such a specific uh, mind frame mindset that basically you think you will get away with it, whatever you do. If I can just offer, because this is actually something that I get asked a lot and I think about it a lot. And I think the one thing that would make a difference is how widespread prosecutions are. If you think about it in, in wartime, violence, different kinds of violence, we tend to prosecute a drop in the bucket in the former Yugoslavia, in Rwanda, maybe to a lesser extent because of all the, the Chacha proceedings. But as a, as, a, you know, as, a, as a matter of fact, and this I'm afraid will also be the case in Ukraine, a, a tiny fragment of people are put through the legal process as we know it, and potentially in, in some end up in jail, hopefully after a fair trial. The vast majority do not. They have, you know, in the former Yugoslavia, we had several hundred people um, go through the process in The Hague, but but also, you know, domestically, I remember working in Bosnia, we had anything between five and 10,000 potential suspects. So that doesn't mean that they're all murderers and rapists, but out of the five to 10,000, there's credible evidence that, you know, these people should be investigated. I think the message would be sent more strongly and that people would consider their behavior um, more thoroughly if the statistical chances of you being uh, uh, put through the process were higher. Now you know that you're a drop in the bucket. You, you know that the chances are really not uh, very high. But if those chances increased, if there was a more systematic approach to um, accountability across the world, across different countries, I think, I think maybe the empirical evidence could show something different. If, if I may immediately. Um, there is a huge problem there. So I think basically uh, that today we stumbled across two really interesting things. Like one is that certainly a collaboration between a number of practitioners and probably some lawyers would be quite helpful in creating some sort of code of ethics of people dealing with the genocidal violence. Not people committing it, but people researching it. That's, that's, that's I think, a huge, huge takeaway. The other one is about this thing with war and prosecution. Uh, the war brings about an inverted reality in which crime is an everyday occurrence. So basically, even in peacetime, only a fraction of any sort of Absolutely. crime is being prosecuted. Yeah. But somehow we live with it and somehow we lull ourselves into believing that we live in orderly societies where crimes would be punished. And then in reality, we see that they are not, even, especially white collar crimes, let's say. But it's okay. In war, this becomes all too obvious. The crime is all over the place. We can't even prosecute the worst possible crimes uh, effectively. Let alone those, you know, you take criminal code of any country and take any forensic situation and you will see that there is so much criminality. It's not only about committing 
uh, a murder. It's about not reporting. It's about aiding and abetting. It's about instigating yeah. and this and that. So basically, how many perpetrators Eva tried to assess in her book loosely, but the problem is that you define a perpetrator there. If you define it in a loose way of who incited and who went along and who didn't report, uh, the number will just go Balloons, up, 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 yeah. up. Exactly. And this is the reality that it's very unpleasant to face. So we are just not not facing it. If we were to be facing it, we would understand that most of the criminal uh, continental criminal code uh, codes are useless in that respect, because they vest on the assumption that we should prosecute all the crimes. Uh, now, that would be impossible because of the time lag and because of the actual lack of space, even if you would be able to catch all those people. Uh, which means that even the states vested in continental law, they would just have to bite their lip and say, no, we will not. But what we are going to do, we are going to make a comprehensive strategy for prosecuting war crimes in which they would spell out what are they going to do. We have so much money. We have so many people we ought to investigate. We will prioritize. And then they would say what? The most guilty ones, the most hideous crimes, uh, I don't know, the, the, the more rep most representative crimes, or there will be some sort of territorial uh, allocation of the caseload, which needs to be brought. Any sort of strategy is better than no strategy at all. For a continental lawyer, that's a taboo, because you have to spell out that many people are going to walk free. Mm -hmm. However, if you do not do that, you get a, a landscape which is completely voluntary. You get a prosecutor who can prosecute whatever comes to his or her mind because you have the power and the obligation, legal obligation, to do that, right? But in reality, in Bosnia, especially <coughs> in Serbia, that meant that you basically do whatever your political masters tell you to do. So having a strategy to prosecute war crimes is of huge importance. It's not a coincidence that in Bosnia and in Serbia, it took years, if not decades, to come up with a comprehensive strategy. That strategy obliges the national judiciary. So this is why they were uh, basically procrastinating that process for such a long period. And now they have excellent strategies, but so many years passed that now you don't have really so many witnesses, evidence, and the accused. So in the end, we will have the supreme juris, uh, juris, uh, uh, jurisprudence on war crimes, I mean, the Balkan states, and we will have excellent specialized courts, as excellent police units, and a good strategy, but we will not have anybody to prosecute in the end. However, this is our experience, which I always keep conveying to my Ukrainian colleagues, because unfortunately, Absolutely. they yeah. deal with the subject matter in real time. And I see many things happening all over again, the zeal to prosecute, the zeal to prosecute before <laughs> the procedure is actually done, and all those things. And I keep saying this one thing, strategy, strategy, strategy. Um, and um, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, no, I think you're absolutely, I, I, I'm actually really glad that we kind of ended on, on the issue of Ukraine, because I see, and I've done talks about this as well, how many parallels we can see and how many lessons can be learned of dealing with this stuff. When you see, I understand why you see Ukrainian principles saying we will prosecute everyone, but you won't because it's not possible, because right. you're not some godly creature that can, you know, transcend resources and, and you know, evidence and, and, and expertise and, and all of that. So I think what you made the point very clearly is that it's, you know, what I was also saying about this being a drop in the bucket. And I think it's more honest to say we won't be able to prosecute everyone. We won't be able to prosecute right. probably the majority. But let's talk about what we can do. But it's difficult politically, and I think that's why people generally don't um, uh, don't do it, or don't want to do it, or don't want to accept. But I just think it, it would be just much healthier for Ukrainians to look at us former Yugoslavs and and to learn from our struggles uh, to organize their own uh, kind of processes better as they relate to paramilitaries, mm -hmm. but also more broadly for accountability. I would just like to add to that that I do think the advancement with regard to Ukraine is the fact that it was so early to document crimes. And I actually contributed to the New Lines Institute report that came out in May on, you know, the egregious violations of the genocide um, convention. So I, I give them credit on that. But I agree with both of you that there's just no way there's not enough money, there's not enough time. And they they need to be honest about it because it's it's a as everybody knows the experience in former Yugoslavia there was a lot of disappointment um, yeah. over over the years. And lastly, I want to thank both of you for an excellent excellent conversation, Eva. It's so great to have you here, and I hope the the you know your book talks continue. I think it should be a reference for anybody who's teaching on the Balkans and. Um, 
I'll take that up with my students as well. And thank you very much, Vlado. I really appreciated your comments. I'm going to go back look at, at YouTube because it will be on the um, Harriman YouTube channel since I missed about 20 minutes of it. So I want to thank both of you so much. It's been uh, a great conversation. Thank you so much, Tanya, for the invitation. And thank you, Vlada, for very um, interesting and insightful things that I haven't thought of, uh, which, which I think is really difficult given how, how long we've known each other and how long we've been struggling with these uh, questions. So thank you so much again for the invitation and for the hosting. Um, and it was really my, my pleasure and my joy to, to see you in the audience here. So I would just tell the audience, you know, we have ongoing Balkan programming and please check our webpage at the Harriman for upcoming programs. So thank you and have everyone have a good day wherever you are. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone. Bye.